Now, this being Mission Sunday, and me being a missions pastor, I decided, God, what do you want? Amen. And he wanted a mission emphasis. He wanted a missional sermon. And so I thought, but God, isn't that kind of obvious? But I, uh, I get it, and I'm going to be obedient. I'm going to ensure that with this space, the final frontier. <laughs> These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. It's five-year continuing mission to explore strange new worlds, to seek out new life and new civilizations. Does anybody know the next line? To boldly go where no man has gone before. And you know what? This is the first time, and it's probably going to be the last time, that I do a Star Trek opening. Yeah. But here's the thing. We're going to take part of this title sequence, and we're going to run with it this morning. It's to boldly go. God calls us to make disciples, and that requires us to do, to boldly go. So we're going to talk about why we need to boldly go. Next, we're going to talk about bold prayer. Then we're going to talk about our next step. So if you want to turn to Acts chapter 4. And as you do that, I'm going to also. But uh, easier for me is I got it marked. And while you're turning there, I'm going to give you some background. Peter and John had just healed a man, a lame man that was in front of the temple. And as this man was healed or God healed the man through uh, John and Peter. They were arrested, and the Sanhedrin were in front of them. Now, what you've got to understand is one of the men who was in the Sanhedrin at the time was Caiaphas. Does anybody know that name? He was the man who was in charge when Jesus was put on the cross. So he was a real threat. And here, Peter and John got their day in court with the same guy. Now, he wasn't the head guy at this point. That would be his son. But we pick up from there, and we're going to go to Acts 4, and we're going to start with verse 13. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were educate, uneducated and untrained men, they marveled, and they realized that they had been with Jesus. And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these men? For indeed, that a notable miracle had been done through him, them is evident, to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we can't deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them, that from now on they speak no man to no man in this name. So they called them and commanded them to speak, not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter 
And John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported to all the chief priests and elders had said to them. So when they heard that, they raised their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, you are God who made heaven and earth and the sea and all that is in them, who by the mouth of your servant David have said, why did the nations rage and the people plot in vain? The kings of the earth took their stand and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For truly against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, were gathered together to do whatever your hand and your purpose determined before to be done. Now, Lord, look on these, their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now I'm going to take bits and pieces out of that passage. So why boldly go? Why do we need to go? In Romans 5.12, and, and I'm going to have a lot of different passages, so if you need to write them down, go ahead. If you don't have a pen and paper, borrow your neighbor's. Like digging your wife's purse or something. I'm just kidding. If I dug in my wife's purse, I'd get smacked. <laughs> Not really. But anyway, just uh, there's also hopefully going to be a video. So you'll be able to uh, catch it again. But Romans 5.12. Therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sinned. So here is our problem. This is where it all starts. Adam, he failed. And because he failed, we were born into sin, right? That's what it says. So since we were born into sin... then death follows. So if you go to Romans 6.23, it says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So we had a death sentence. We had a sentence placed on us because Adam was our representative. So think about it this way. If you were placed in jail for something that you, would, you knew you did, when I was born in sin, when I was a kid, I wouldn't share with Todd. And not only did I get it from mom and dad, but that started a journey for me. That started a journey of sin. When Todd told on me, which he did pretty regularly, then what I would do would say, no, it wasn't me. I lied. Part of K 
carrying on in my sin. Now as we age, our sins become more elaborate, more fancy in a sense. But it's still sin. And in our wages of sin is death. So if I was thrown in jail and I knew that I did something that was just terrible, and all of a sudden I get the death penalty. How do you think I'm going to react? That's okay, you can't answer. How, how do you think I'm going to react? Panic? Crying? It's fear, right? We would be scared. I would be scared. And all of a sudden... They walk me to the table where they're going to lay me down and put a drug in to kill me. But as they lay me on the table, the phone rings, and it's the governor, and he pardons me. Do you think that once I get out of the jail, that I'm going to keep it to myself. No. No. Let me tell you, I am going to be telling everybody I knew how cool that governor was. See, our wages of sin was death. But... In Romans 10, 9, it says, If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Jesus came with our pardon. And we have to give him lordship. As well as believe If I had a chair up here, and I know you guys have heard this one before. If I had a chair up here, and it looked really bad. If I sat in it, what does that say? That I have faith in that chair, right? That I'm going to have faith that that chair is going to hold me. And that when I sit down, I'm not going to wind up on the ground. See, if we put faith in God, then it's the same type of thing. Then we know that He saved us. We know that He rescued us. And as we know that He rescued us, what should be our response? We would be telling people, right? We'd be telling people, this is cool. And let me tell you what Jesus did for me. We have people who are dying in our neighborhoods in our work, we have people who are dying all around us. And a lot of times we keep quiet because we think, I'll be rejected or I'll be ostracized. Same thing. Or I'll be made fun of. I'm going to bring up some of our missionaries. Some of them are going into places where they cannot just be made fun of. 
they won't just be rejected, but they could be uh, killed, imprisoned. They could be sent home to America. But we have the cure. And if we know we have the cure, if, if a doctor came to you and you knew you had cancer and you knew it was stage four, and a doctor came to you and said, we've got an experimental drug. And that doctor gave you the drug and it totally cured you. We wouldn't say, oh, I'm going to be rejected if I tell people this. I'm going to be made fun of. No. No, we would be telling people. We would be boldly going, right? The reason we have to boldly go is we've been cured. We've been set free. Peter and John did not consider their lives to be important compared to the people getting the cure. They were threatened severely. And what did Peter and John say? They said, you know what? You judge for yourself whether we listen to you or we listen to God. And this is what you can say to those people in your head. I mean, don't exactly say to it that to them. But have this attitude to where you will just go, you know what, I can listen to you or I can listen to God. Who do you think I should listen to? So they saw people, Peter and, and John, they saw people as Jesus sees people. In Matthew 23, 37, Jesus looked in front of Jerusalem and he was on the, the uh, Mount of Olives and he said, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are see sent to her. My printer messed up. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. He was shattered. But he continued to reach out. He continued to set people free. He continued to heal people. He continued to go to that cross. And because he went to that cross, that shows his love for us. In John 15, 12 through 13, Jesus said, This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that they lay down one's life for his friends. Back in the day, there was a tragedy that happened on 9-11. The World Trade Towers were crumbling. And when people were leaving the building... The firefighters and the policemen were rushing in. They didn't count their lives so highly that they wouldn't go in to save many. And since this is July 4th, in the Revolutionary War, Valley Forge Men were freezing to death, but they did not run. They did not get out of there because there was something bigger than them. The same with any war. You could pick it. You can pick the Battle of D-Day. You can pick um, the Civil War. People fought were for what they believed in. but it was something that was bigger than themselves. 
we have something bigger than ourselves. We have someone bigger than ourselves. See, they knew. They knew that something was bigger. But our motivation should be bigger than us. To help rescue those who are lost, we have the cure. And since we have the cure, then we need to spread the cure. So that's the reason we go. So next, to boldly go, we need to pray boldly. In Acts 4.13, the Sanhedrin were in front of Peter and John. And they said, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. In Acts 4, 29 through 30, it says, Now the Lord, and this is the, the, the church praying, Now, Lord, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness that they may speak your word by stretching out your hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus Christ. And when they had prayed, the place where they were shaken, were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. What did they pray for? They could have prayed to be released from this regime. They could have been praying for protection, but they didn't. They said, God, give us boldness that we may speak your word boldly. God, that you would help us not to be afraid of this regime. But God, give us boldness. Our society right now is very tough on Christianity. And so many times we as Christians, we lick our wounds and we say, oh, if only God would protect us. God, if you would just change our regime, if you would change our government. Well, God isn't calling us for that. He's calling us to spread the word of God boldly. And so what we have to be praying is God, help me to be bold. Give me boldness. Now I'm going to read to you. This is from the Strong's Concordance. And it's about the word boldness in this passage. And this totally blew me away. Boldness. Parthasia. I practiced that word. It means outspokenness, unreserved utterance, freedom of speech with frankness, candor, cheerful courage, and the opposite of cowardice, timidity, or fear. Here it denotes a divine enablement that comes to ordinary and unprofessional people exhibiting spiritual power and authority. It also refers to a clear presentation of the gospel without being ambiguous or unintelligible. It is not a human quality, but it is a result of being filled with the Spirit. Did you catch that? Ordinary and unprofessional people. Who all fits that bill? 
Just a few of us. I'll talk more about that later. I'm getting ahead of myself and I'm getting excited. So let's look at another person that we deem unordinary, okay? In Ephesians 6, 19 through 20, Paul spoke and he said to the Galatians, and for me that utterance may be given to me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. <clears throat> This was Paul, of all people. And he was asking the Galatians to pray for boldness for him right after he talked about the spiritual armor. This is the man. And we look up to Paul a lot. And we say, man, if I could be like that guy. But what does he do? He says, pray for me that I would get boldness that I would have boldness to speak. See, it comes with bold prayer. It's prayer that says, I don't care about anything else, God, but I want to serve you without hesitation, without fear, without timidity, without cowardice. Let me tell you, this is a tough thing because this is where I came from. I came from a life of timidity. I came from a life of fear. But thank God that He healed me of those things. That He has given me words to say. You know what? I'm getting ahead of myself again. But if Paul was asking the Galatians to pray for boldness for him, then shouldn't we? Should we not clamor after boldness and say, God, and it comes right with, with being filled with the Spirit. We need to be going, God, above all else, let me be your man. Let me be your woman. Let me be your missionary. When uh, Andrew and, and Caleb and I went to Winchester, the pastor introduced us to a few of the places and they called us here are our missionaries and uh, I, I never thought of it that way you are missionaries you are the missionaries for your sphere of influence you are the sphere your missionary for your job God has planted you where he's wanted you. You are a missionary for those around you. And it's as if God were appealing through us. And I'll read that passage a little later. But Pastor Paul talked about Pentecost last week and how the people in the upper room waited to be baptized in the Spirit before they did any ministry. And I thought Pastor Paul was going to take my message. <laughs> there was some things that he said that I had written down already, and I'm going, don't say too much. <laughs> but see, this is a springboard because not only do we need to be filled with the Spirit, but we need to step into that, that ministry, to that calling. See, the, the people in the upper room, if they had stayed in the upper room, if they had said, 
No, we love it here. We like the feel of the wind. We like the, the brightness of the fire. We're going to stay right here in God's presence. See, God gave them the Holy Spirit for the power for witness. And He does with us too. When we pray boldly, the Holy Spirit will not deny us. He will baptize us. He will fill us. He will empower us for the purposes that Jesus has for you. You have a calling. You are called people. God has given you a purpose. And even though you may not be up here speaking, even though you may not be leading this a huge ministry. God has called you where you are. And because God has called you, He has equipped you and He will empower you to do what He's called you to do. You are His missionaries. So it brings me to my next step to boldly go then we need to step out in faith as God directs we just don't stay there revelation well I'll just say this the enemy would love nothing better than to keep you where you're at he would love for you to be able to be frozen with fear. That you wouldn't reach the person next to you. In Revelation 12, 9 through 11, it says, So the great dragon was, east, was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come. For the accuser of our brethren, who accused them before our God day and night, has been cast down. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by word of the, word of the testimony. In that passage, he's called the accuser. In that passage, he's called the deceiver. He will tell you, point blank, you can't boldly, boldly go because you aren't good enough or you don't know enough or insert the uh, doubt here. I was there. I still am sometimes. For years, I believed his lies. I could give you every excuse why I could not be used of God. I could tell you. I was too quiet. I'm too shy. I'm too sinful. I'm too ordinary. I didn't quote scripture from memory. See, I felt like God couldn't use a small town boy from Monmouth, Illinois. And I did not mean to rhyme there. <laughs> but even Jesus, when people looked at him, they said, isn't he the one from Galilee? How could a small town boy from Galilee, how can he be the Messiah? Now, I am not saying that I am the Messiah. I am far from it. And I am thanking God for that. But what I'm saying is, 
Satan has lied to you. As he has lied to me. He has told you you are worth nothing. You are less than. You can't boldly go. Because you've got this issue. You've got this sin. And God, guys are never going to believe you if you tell them to follow Christ. Do not believe the lies. Because if you do, it will freeze you and God's purpose for you will never happen. I never want to be the person that when a person is condemned, they look at me and they say, you could have told me. You knew Jesus. Why didn't you say something? See, God calls us to be bold. God calls us to speak the truth. God calls us to save, to seek and to save the lost. There was a man that I listened to one time. His name was Ron Hutchcraft. And uh, this was when I was in high school. And he had talked about one time how a person he knew had a vision. And he said there was all of these lifeguards standing on the deck talking. And there was a man out far into the water and, and he was drowning and he was calling for help and he was um, trying to get their attention. But the missionaries were too busy talking to each other. And the guy said to God, what does this mean? He said, you as Christians... You get into your groups, and this hit me hard, and it still does. You get into your groups, and you have this fellowship. And he said, that's all well and good, because you need the fellowship. But when people are outside the church walls, and they are asking for help, then we need to be helping then we need to be saving them. And see, I can just see these lifeguards saying, you know what, I'm not that good a swimmer. I'm not that adept at saving people. You know what, if I go out there and, and I grab him, he'll grab me and he'll pull me under. See, Satan will lie to us. But the people of this early church, they believed 2 Corinthians 5.20. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. In 12.11, Revelation 12.11 that I had just read earlier. They overcome him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Every lie that Satan tells you, you can overcome him by the word of your testimony and the blood of the lamb. He can, you can say, no, I was him. I was her. But because Jesus saved me, I am not that person anymore. See, the early church knew that. They believed Revelation 1, 5 through 6. 
and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. They believed that. God has made you priests, and he's made you kings. He has made you his ambassador. You are important. Let me say that again. You are important. Jesus saved you. Jesus has called you. He has given you the role of ambassador. He has given you the role of priest, and he has given you the role as king or queen. You are royalty. Do not ever believe the lies that Satan tells you. You are worth more than that. Jesus would never have died for you if you weren't worth something. So go. Go boldly. As this church stepped out, God moved in incredible ways. I'm going to read to you Acts 4, 31 through 33, and you guys are probably there. And it says, And when they prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they spoke the word of God with boldness. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. They stepped out and God moved. We need to be obedient to what God calls us to do. See, when they were obedient, when they prayed and they stepped out, they spoke the word of God with boldness. If you pray for boldness today, God is not going to deny you. The Holy Spirit will not deny you. You will have boldness. We need to step out in that boldness. So that boldness, that obedience, what, is that, what does that look like? It could mean praying for somebody, maybe at CR, or maybe in our sphere, sphere of influence. It could mean talking to people about what Jesus did for you. It could be serving someone who needs help. It could be going to another country. I want to tell you about something that happened not too long ago. Um, a few of us went to Winchester. Quite a few, actually. It was pretty cool. But I want you to know something. We got a card from the missions cultivators that actually were in charge of the Winchester event. And on that card, they put, thank you, thank you, thank you in big letters. And then they said, we are so thankful for Calvary and the people that came. We could never say thank you enough. And then they said, and uh, not to embarrass you, Andrew, but they said, Andrew and Caleb, because of what they did 
because what we did was we went door to door. They said what they did was the turning point in the event. They said because of that, 18% of the population of Winchester came to the outreach. 18% of the city were touched by Jesus in one way or another. And those who did go, you may say, well, I didn't do much. Lie from Satan. I didn't pray for many people. I was in the grocery department. So I didn't get to pray for anybody in that event. And it frustrated me. But when God spoke, he put you where he had you. And because he put you where he had you, you showed the love of Christ. You showed the gospel in its truest form. Now, I'm not saying this to give you guys big heads because the job is not done. You have people in your neighborhoods. You have people in your workplace. They are hurting. They are crushed. And they're just looking for somebody who will throw them a life preserver. Will you be the one? Will you be that man, that woman that throws that thing and saves them? See, we're not stepping into air. We're not stepping into um, nothing when God calls us to do something. God will be there to move. When we move, God moves. Because he's called you to it, and if he's called you to it, then he's going to help you through it. And when God helps you through it, you know what? He may have already prepared the way. The Holy Spirit may have been there, days before you and prepared that heart. Let's be people who are bold. Let's be people who take a stand and we tell Satan, you will not have her. You will not have him because they are precious to the Father. They are precious to him. This great king of glory, the one we sang about, the one who is holy, 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 he sent you. He sent you. So let's be that man. Let's be that woman that God called us to be. So we need to check our motives. Do we love and have compassion on people like Jesus does? Do we need to seriously and boldly pray for boldness and that God would use us? Lastly, are we willing and ready to step out no matter where God calls us? Can I have the worship team?
if everybody would bow their heads. And I want you to know that God prepared this sermon and he he spoke and he said I want you guys to know that I'm here that I am here when I call you to do something. Boldly go. See, the the sermon title came to me weeks ago. And I'm going, "God, God, what do you mean by boldly go? There's so many things I could be. And now I get it.